I invite you to, oops. I invite you to stand as you are able for our gospel reading. The Gospel of John. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham. We've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Happy Reformation Day, everybody. (laughs) Thanks. Now, this is not, you know, like a widely held holiday. So maybe you're not quite as liturgically nerdy as I am, which is totally fine. Right? Like, I get that. And uh, so I thought that instead of talking about Reformation, we might actually want to talk a little bit about Thanksgiving, because I feel like everybody has a story about Thanksgiving. Now, my Thanksgiving doesn't look anything like this one. I don't know if yours do, but my family's Thanksgiving looks nothing like this. In some part, because neither of my grandmas cooked, so we had different we still ate food, but it just w- wasn't this. And um, my dad's grandma was very German. So American Thanksgiving involved a lot of recipes similar to what she brought with her from a long time ago. And uh, so we have this tradition called apple raisin dressing. So it actually goes, it gets, you have some of this too? Okay, good. I'm not making this up. It's a German thing. But when my great grandma, when I was a teenager, she was getting older. She lived to be 101. So as she got older, my aunt sat her down and said, could you please write down some recipes, right? This is a tradition. You're all nodding. Like this happens. So she wrote down apple raisin dressing, one yellow bowl of apples, one red cup of raisins. The bread had to be Great Aunt Martha's bread recipe, which she was not able to write down. So my aunt got this recipe written in my great grandma's very scratchy hand and basically looked at my dad and said, what are we going to do with this? And the short answer was, we're going to experiment a lot. And they experimented, came up with an apple raisin dressing recipe that's written down and my dad has been making every year for at least 25 years. And um, that's fantastic, right? Now I see it on Pinterest every once in a while, but like we, you know, we didn't know about that. So no stovetop in our house, for sure, definitely. Well, the first year David and I were hosting my family for Thanksgiving, we decided we wanted to make the apple raisin dressing recipe, right? Do any of you have this memory of your first couple years of being married and the table's full of weird stuff? Because you got to take his stuff and her stuff. And when you put it together, it's not their stuff. It's just too much stuff. Yeah. So we tried this, but we tried to modify apple raisin dressing because we were no longer eating white bread. Right, right, you're laughing, because the wheat bread we put in, we tried to tell my dad, like, we probably don't need the same exact number of slices of wheat bread as white bread, but it didn't work, so the whole thing was a hot mess. We managed, in a couple of years, to modify apple raisin dressing to something that I love and David will at least tolerate, but I have never brought it to his family's Thanksgiving, because every time I mention it, like, they just have looks of horror on their face, like, that's not going to work, right? Well, David's grandma is kind of like this grandma, and she had everyone over for Thanksgiving every year for his entire life, and I've done it 15 years now, Um, but they also have some of their own recipes, which she does have written down on little index cards, and then on the back of the index card, she has written down which serving bowl or platter it goes in. So the day before Thanksgiving, the dining room table is set, not for eating, but with all the things and the recipe card in every single one, right? 
Is it? She's a smart one, that Grandma Anderson. So I showed up for this. First off, my family doesn't use recipes at all. So I am completely shocked that his grandma needs 25 index cards for the things she's made every year. So I'm looking at David like, has she never done Thanksgiving before? Like, what's up? And then we sit down, right, to eat all the foods, which are very traditional to his family, which I don't care for. And I bring something with cranberries every year because to me, cranberries are Thanksgiving and every single person in his family is like, I don't know where that came from, but we're not going to touch it. So I'm eating the cranberries, you know, this is how it goes. Well, a few years ago, one of the last years that Grandma Anderson was still able to do Thanksgiving on her own, that year, everybody had a diet issue. I found out I was lactose intolerant. David's younger sister found out she was gluten intolerant. We were inviting a vegetarian to come, and David's dad had just had heart problems and couldn't eat any salt. So grandma's got 15 people around the table, none of whom can eat any of her stuff. You know what she did? Grandma Anderson went on the internet with every single recipe card that she had and came up with a way to modify everything so that that year, every single one of us could eat at least one of the traditional recipes, maybe not all of them, but every single person there could eat something at that Thanksgiving table. Isn't that cool? I bring this up <laughs> because over time, for us, Thanksgiving has changed, even in my short lifetime. The ingredients have changed. Grandma's dishes have all changed. She, so, she sold the house and went into assisted living. We have it now at David's dad's house. All of those traditional dishes, Grandma used to put her cards in, they're all gone. But the recipes are still there, just in new dishes, right? The ingredients change, the dishes change, the people change, the locations change, the love, the gratitude, the thankfulness, the faith, the family, that doesn't change. And that's what makes it Thanksgiving right? So we talk instead a lot about Lutheranism, especially at Reformation. And we tend to think that what we're celebrating is something that happened 502 years ago, that one moment in time when this one German monk said this one thing about the Catholic Church and reformed it, and we're going to keep celebrating that Reformation 502 years later. We even make jokes about how little Lutherans are willing to change. But I get the sense that Lutherans like change the same amount as everyone likes change, which is not a whole heck of a lot. No one is really excited when your Thanksgiving recipe gets tossed out on the curb. And frankly, who started putting marshmallows on sweet potatoes? That's disgusting. I'm sorry. That's not a thing. Nobody should do that. So that's fine. Personal preference. But everyone has a thing, right? A tradition they love, a tradition they hate, a tradition they put up with. And Lutherans have actually been reforming for 502 years. We didn't stop. We don't keep celebrating the way we were way back then. The traditions have changed, the buildings have changed, the locations have changed, the people have changed, but the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit has always remained the same. All right, what I'm going to say next might shock some of you, but you're sitting, you'll be fine. Lutherans have been constantly reforming. Quick history lesson, I promise it's quick, even though my timer's broken, from a former history teacher. This is what we think of when we think of Protestant Reformation. Luther, bald guy in the middle, arguing with the German princes and the German cardinals, who were all the same, right, at that time, fighting against Catholicism, not to replace it or remove it, but to reform it. It didn't work, so after his death, a group of folks called themselves Lutherans because they wanted to follow his reforms instead of the Catholic Church. But this was hard in Germany at the time. I'll skip the hundred years of Protestant Reformation. You can wiki it. But it was really tough. It was really tricky. Well, in the 1600s, Lutheranism actually spread to Scandinavia. And if you notice, it's, they're still arguing about it in Germany. But in Scandinavia, there, the royalty very quickly decided, nope, we're all German, and since I'm, I'm sorry, no, we're all Lutheran, and since I'm Lutheran, you're Lutheran too, and overnight, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland were all magically Lutheran. They didn't choose it. <laughs> it just happened to them, right? Kind of the opposite of what was going on in Germany. 
So that meant that Scandinavian Lutheranism and German Lutheranism were pretty different in the 15 and 1600s. But in the 1700s, this very friendly looking uh, <laughs> Swedish guy, I mean, honestly, who cannot love that face? He had some pretty dramatic reforms for the Scandinavian Lutheran Church. He had this crazy idea that this one human being cannot separate their secular life or their everyday life from their sacred life or their church life. That we are not two different people, we're one people. And those things mush. So on a Tuesday afternoon when you're shouting out prayers and on a Sunday morning when you're trying to figure out what time the Packers game is, you're the same person. You're blending the parts of you that are focused on God and the parts of you that are living in the world all the time. And that's just how faith is. So he was coming up with this incredibly radical idea, which is that the building and the hymnal and the traditions and the candles are not nearly as important as integrating your faith into daily life. Now, this was so radical that people thought that he was going to be the next Luther and break the church, right? What they, what they heard was, burn the churches, which he never said. So he wrote this, hymnal, this hymn, which is actually in our hymnal, and it goes, built on the rock the church stands, even when steeples are falling. So even if our church falls apart, the building, the rock is Jesus. Every land has crumbled churches, he says, but all the bells are still chiming because everyone is longing for this everlasting life. In other words, Jesus stays the same. What I'm asking for is something different, but the same as it's always been. This was a huge change at the time. Then in the 1800s, big change, Lutherans showed up on this continent. Lots of them, loads of them. But guess what they couldn't pack with them? Their hymnals, their organs, their pyramids, their steeples. They showed up with faith and traditions in their brains and their hearts and their souls, and they tried desperately to build a Lutheran church right here. A lot of us have stories about our grandparents or great-grandparents who tried to build a church here, and they saved money and they built something, but what they came up with took time. Scandinavian Lutherans brought this idea of mixing sacred and secular and got their kids into public schools right away and got involved right away in the community and connected their faith to their daily life in really real ways. And today, what that means is that Minnesota has some of the best social programs in the entire United States. They're some of the closest American programs to what Scandinavia offers, right? Germans, which was my family, showed up and decided to build little walls and keep everyone safe. <laughs> my grandpa went to German school and German church and only knew people who spoke German who only lived three miles from his house and he never left the county his whole life because everyone else is scary, right? That's the German Lutheran concept of Lutheranism. Then, in, well, and what a lot of people forget is that Lutheranism also came to Latin America from some of the same European areas, because for about 10 years, Mexico was part of Germany. It happened, it was a thing. Um, then, while the United States was trying to figure out what it meant to be Lutheran, we were also, in the 1900s, sending Lutheranism to Africa. And in Africa, the Holy Spirit managed to work without organs or hymnals or pyramids or church buildings or even rostered pastors or seminaries. And in fact, 100 years later, the Holy Spirit is still working without many of those things in that place. There are more Lutherans in Tanzania. Tanzania is the blue section in the middle right. So Madagascar is the island, not that one, but north of Madagascar is Tanzania. More Lutherans in Tanzania alone than all of the United States. And there's five or six countries there with about as many Lutherans as the U.S. There's more Lutherans in Africa than there are in Europe right now on an average Sunday. So Reformation is going to be happening outside with no organs, no mighty fortress, outside with millions and millions and millions of people this weekend in the continent of Africa. But the Holy Spirit was still working, right? In the late 1900s, well, throughout the 1900s in the United States, Lutheranism was merging. 
Because all of a sudden it didn't make sense for a Finnish Lutheran church in the UP of Michigan and a Swedish Lutheran church in northern Wisconsin to not work together. Because by now everybody was doing everything in English. It didn't make sense for a Lutheran church in America and an American Lutheran church to be on the same corner and not work together. It just didn't make sense. So we had, we had merger after merger in the 20s and then in the 60s and then the ELCA was created in the 1980s. The German Lutheran version, the Missouri Synod, has never merged. They showed up, one boat, 1847, had lots of babies, never merged with anyone. They're pretty specific. When the ELCA was created in 1988, one of their commitments was based on that very friendly looking Scandinavian dude's idea of blending the secular and the sacred. So the ELCA became committed to engaging with society in a way that honors our faith in everyday life. It was a commitment of the ELCA in 1988. But because there was no internet and for lots of other reasons, that didn't actually trickle down to congregations that year. Because all of the pastors who were currently in those churches had been trained in a specific seminary a long time before that. So the fact that the ELCA was formed in 88 didn't change local congregations or your local pastor that year. It took time for that change to show up. So then, 10 or 20 years after the ELCA existed, people started saying things like, when did this happen? And the answer is, it happened in 1988. We just didn't have Twitter to tell you about it. It happened then. And so young folks like me that have been raised and soaked in this for 30 years don't know, we don't know, we know in our brains, but we don't know in our hearts what that looks like to be a Lutheran in 1952, any more than I know what it is to be a Lutheran in 1652 in Denmark. This is not part of my experience. So all of this comes together to say that the ELCA has been creating a bunch of social statements since that time. Um, and we'll talk more about that in just a minute. But the Holy Spirit has been doing all of this work in the Lutheran tradition, yet we are still slaves. And this is the part where you go, we, us, just like the folks in the gospel, we're not slaves, we're Americans. We're not slaves, we're Lutherans, right? We don't have to do anything, we're Lutherans. Well, we're still slaves in somewhat because we're still tied to false choices, which denomination do I join? Which building do I attend? Which hymnal do we use? Which pastor do we call? Which pyramid do we hang? Continuum, 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 as if we have been freed by God's grace 2,000 years ago, just to be enslaved once again to a brand new religious hierarchy of rules and regulations. And at some point, we begin to realize that it's, oh, I love this. This is the church for everyone. We have a classic service at 8, contemporary at 9, mid-century modern at 10, postmodern 11, boomer at noon, millennials at 1, blended at 2, and happy hour at 4. We made everyone happy, right? <laughs> I absolutely love this image. Everyone's happy and nobody's happy, right? <laughs> Isn't that fun? We're still tied to false choices. Choices like this, which as silly as they are, don't make a lot of sense. Except until on Reformation Day, when we rehear re the scriptures that inspired Luther, we realize it's not our choices that bring about this change. We're freed by Christ from our choices. We are saved from the limited options in front of us. And thus, through grace, we are open to whatever the Holy Spirit is leading us to. Disciples are always reforming and renewing ourselves, our congregations, our communities. We are freed from the rules and traditions, and we are freed to go out and love. Love. Because love is faith in action. Love is calling out for justice, taking care of society, generously serving one another, liberating others from the sin which entraps them. Love leads us to crazy journeys. When David and I started trying to share Thanksgiving 15 years ago, we had no idea what it would look like this year. This year when I'm trying my fourth version of cranberry recipe to see if someone somewhere will please eat cranberries. We didn't know that it would be okay to keep going to David's family every year for Thanksgiving and not mine. We had to kind of walk through the journey together. 
So now Christ the King is being invited into a new process that might feel a little scary. I was called on a three-year term call, which means that my current call expires in August of next year. That could be really scary, or it could be a really fun invitation to explore and discover over the next 10 months where the Holy Spirit is calling us. What does the neighborhood need? What is God saying to us? Who are we as a church? How do we live out faith and action in this community? And why does the world need us to be here? No matter how we go about that, no matter how we do it, we will constantly be reforming and renewing. And no matter what, the Holy Spirit's going to be in charge. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as you're able and join us. Oh, let's have a prayer as we get ready. Lord, Reformation is scary because we really like using all the recipes and traditions we did last year because we knew it worked. But instead, you're calling us to try new things, to work together, and above all, to keep love, faith, grace, and unity centered to our lives. So Lord, as we are freed from the rules and freed to love, continue to free us to imagine what might just be possible. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join us for our next song.